Jen and team and welcome back everybody and a big welcome to anybody new. I'm excited to bring you Civic Awakening, the focus on culture in the Heartside neighborhood walking tour series. So I hope you have your comfortable shoes on as we start once again on the front lawn of the studio park. And here we are on a beautiful sunny day in the photograph and a quasi threatening day in local Grand Rapids. And maybe we're okay that we're doing this virtually. So the early settlers of Grand Rapids, they were relatively well educated. They came from the east coast of the United States, our earliest settlers. They were transplants. They were uh, the sons and daughters of prosperous New York and New England families who came west to start fresh and to make fortunes here. Uh, I bring that up that uh, relatively well educated because this is in reference to the civic awakening and the cultural growth of our city. Now our country at that point in time in the 1830s to 1900s, uh, we had just entered the Victorian period of history. And that of course, when we refer to the Victorian period of history, we were talking about the reign of Queen Victoria in England. And in the beginning of our earliest history in Grand Rapids, um, it was merely survival in the pioneer village of Grand Rapids. But now as we started building factories and we were settling into our new uh, village and soon city in 1850, men now owned and managed and worked in the furniture factories. And now they were bringing home paychecks. And with bringing home paychecks, this enabled the women to purchase clothing, to purchase food and other necessities. So no, it was also the beginning of commerce in Grand Rapids, but it was also a beginning of, um, again, women weren't out in the backyard churning the butter and slaughtering the pig. They were starting to buy these things. And this free time, if you will, now allowed women who came from this uh, well-educated background to nurse the budding arts culture in our city, to replicate the society that they left behind out east and then in Europe as waves of immigrants came to our city. So one such example of this uh, nursing the budding arts culture was the Ladies Literary Club that you see here in the photograph. And this club actually grew out of a six member history class of women in 1869, and then officially organized in 1873, and then built this Romanesque revival, that is the architecture, this clubhouse in 1887. Its niche as a ladies literary club, as you can tell by the title, was education. So you see this was at a time when higher education was largely denied to women. So the club provided the opportunity for advanced study. The LLC, the Ladies Literary Club, was instrumental in erecting our public library and improving school curriculum. It was one of the first structures, we used to say the first, but we've since learned, I think it was Gina who taught us this, that it was one of the first structures of its kind in the US owned by a women's club. The building was host to many dignitaries, including presidents, William Howard Taft, Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, as well as cultural icons spoke at this building. Uh, poets Robert Frost, Carl Sandburg. Well, go forward in time and this beautiful building stood as a club, as you see today, but it was in the year 2005, the club voted to disband because of declining membership. Women weren't joining 
clubs like this any longer. They were out busy in the world working. So one year later in October 2006, remaining members voted to transfer ownership to Calvin College. It was home for about 10 years to lecture series, concerts, film showings, comedy shows. I used to go see River City Improv there and other special events. In 2014, Calvin College announced that the property was for sale for $500,000. Now in 2019, because it took a while for the building to sell, the new owners, Robert Deverna and several other partners have transformed the historical space into a rentable wedding and event venue. It's called appropriately, The Lit. It has capacity for 175 people with banquet style seating for 300 people in the old auditorium. So you might recall, because it had this exquisite auditorium, intimate, beautiful auditorium, but they leveled the auditorium so that it could be used for banquet style seating. So it's a level floor now. Now there are small brown plates that were screwed to the backs of the chairs in this auditorium and bore the names of people who donated to the Ladies Literary Club. Well, all those plates were salvaged and they now decorate a bar that was added to the building. One of the name plates bears the name of Betty Ford. The property is designated as a historical landmark by the city of Grand Rapids and is also on the National Register of Historic Places. It's a jewel in the Heartside neighborhood. Now across the street is another jewel of a building. And this was at one time the Hotel Browning. It was constructed in 1917 by Alva Brown, thus Hotel Browning. Alva Brown was the son of a Kent County farmer. And he is pictured in the photograph in the top right corner with his wife, Ella. And look at the hats on the two of them. They were fashion trend setters. The wife, Ella. Now the exterior of this carriage, if you look closely at that picture, is covered in paper flowers and there are ribbons tied to the horse harnesses. Were they on their way to a parade? Was this another fashion statement? I, I do not know. But this hotel had 250 rooms when it was in its glory, which helped to ease the pressing need for the affordable hotel space for visiting furniture buyers. In fact, it was the largest of the hotels located in Heartside. It had the most rooms. It even had a four lane bowling alley and a billiard room. Now, I found uh, an advertisement when it opened and this is what it said. One of the finest fireproof family hotels. Fireproof was a, was a sellable feature back then. Each room has a bath. You can pay $2 to $2.50. I'm assuming that's per night. It says, I don't really understand this, no higher weekly rates. Suites with kitchenettes, liberal parking facilities, and a heated garage. So Mr. Brown died in 1932 and the building was acquired as a clinic and hospital. This was in 1938 and it was called the Ferguson Hospital. And many of you remember that this was for the care and surgical treatment of diseases of the colon, colon and rectum. They also, at that time, continued to operate some of the space as hotel rooms. Well, eventually, the building was donated 
uh, by Spectrum Health Services in the mid 1990s to dwelling place for affordable housing. So there are 119 apartments. The building right now is being renovated and brought up to date by dwelling place. So not all of the apartments are occupied right at this moment, but there are space and they're gonna be even more beautiful for 119 of these apartments. Also, we mentioned in previous presentations that Dwelling Place has um, gardens, community gardens uh, throughout, I think it was in four out of their, of their properties in the Heartside neighborhood. And this is one of the community gardens is at the Ferguson Apartments. Okay, so did I say everything I wanted to say about that? Just that Mr. Brown, by the way, was a successful businessman with several businesses. And here's an interesting little factoid about him. He also operated a piggery in Paris Township. And for any of you who don't know, when they say a piggery, that's like today's dump, okay? So the pigs were used for the eating of food. So people actually separated their garbage and he fed 7,000 hogs on our Grand Rapids table waste, it was called. So he operated a piggery in addition to a hotel. So now we are going on to the corner of Sheldon and Oaks. Okay. So at this property, which is actually 41 Sheldon, Ray Becker opened the new Becker Auto Company in 1911. So he was right on the edge. It was the first Ford dealership in the area. So from the late 1930s until 1953, it housed various auto dealerships. It then became a parking garage until purchased by the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts, the UICA that we talked about last week, which re rehabilitated the structure in the late 1990s. Now when UICA moved to their Division Fulton space, the Art Prize headquarters moved in. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, you will see a photograph. Yes, this is the Art Prize headquarters as you know it today. Now on the side of the Art Prize headquarters, so this would be the south facing wall, there is a mural there. And that mural is called A Treasure Trove of Wide-Eyed, Brightly Colored Creatures next to the words, challenge expression, promote dialogue, inspire community. And the piece was created by teens that were participating in an artworks program sponsored by the UICA when their facility was in this building before they moved into their new facility on the corner of Fulton and Division. Our next stop on the tour is the local YWCA. Now, the actual local chapter of the YWCA was founded in 1900. They operated from myriad of rented facilities for nearly a quarter of a century before opening this building that still stands in 1922. It was designed by prolific local architects, Robinson and Campo. It was described at the time that it was open as Grand Rapids gift to girls. The elegantly appointed building provided rooms for the working girls. Unescorted women could eat safely in its cafeteria. You see back then, if you were an unescorted woman, you wouldn't go out to eat in the local diners, in restaurants. That was considered uncouth. Men could, but the women couldn't. So women who were working downtown 
could go to this cafeteria and feel comfortable as an unescorted woman to eat here. Its athletic department featured a swimming pool and a gymnasium in this building where physical education classes were taught. It was a revolutionary feature of the local YMCA, excuse me, YWCA. Now, you see in the beginning of its history in Grand Rapids, the focus was early on about education for women. As it was home to, it was called the Caroline Putnam School, which was a forerunner to community education, lifelong education. Then the YWCA confronted racism starting in the 1940s and Helen Clater locally and nationally was a, uh, a revered civil rights activist. In the 1970s, the YWCA turned their attention to addressing violence against women and children. So today, the YWCA West Central Michigan transforms lives with leadership programs for girls. The YWCA is our community's most comprehensive prevention and intervention services for all people in addressing domestic and dating abuse, sexual assault, child sexual abuse, and stalking. They serve roughly 4,000 women each year. Now we continue our walk. We're going east on Oaks and then we're gonna turn the corner to the grave to this beautiful, incredible, I love this building. It is our engine house number one. And I want you to envision early Grand Rapids. The streets are lined with wooden buildings. They're illuminated by fire, candles, oil lamps, and we heated with wood stoves. So fires were dangerously commonplace. Fire protection consisted mainly of a few fire buckets and as many hands as possible. I read that at one time it was a city ordinance that a fire bucket had to hang inside the doorway of every house downtown. The makeshift fire brigade gave way to 10 majestic firehouses in Grand Rapids. By the year 1910, we had a citywide system. The original, the original engine house number one was built in 1854, but it was located at Monroe and Commerce. What is now today's Grand Rapids Police Department, originally on that property was fire engine house number one. Now there was a second engine house number one built in 1870, but it was on the west side of La Grave, because today it's on the east side. It's just half a block south of this location you see here. So the third version of engine house number one was relocated and rebuilt here, opened in the year 1911. It included both the administrative offices and the dispatch office. And they were, they had been in the old number four engine house at Crescent and Bond, but they were relocated here. It is the largest station built to this date. It is here in 1910 or 1911, if you can imagine, three teams of horses were installed. By 1902, because our fire engines were pulled by horses throughout the city, the department actually had its own veterinarian. So prior to 1870, when an alarm was turned in, it required from about 10 to 12 minutes to hook up the horses and drive out. Bells in the engine houses were rung by hand from information given by passersby. You know, we joke about uh, uh, spill in aisle three in the grocery store. Well, you'd have a passerby say fire on Crescent Street. 
If there was a fire in the north end of town, the whistle upon C.C. Comstock's factory would be blown, and a fire in the south end of town would be indicated by the ringing of the big bell on St. Andrew's Cathedral. In the early 1870s, the system of housing and harnessing the horses and sounding the alarms began to change. A system of quartering the horses and stalls at the rear of the apparatus room was in use. The stall doors were now on springs and when an alarm was sounded, the stall doors sprung open, the horses were released, they took their assigned places at the front of the machines and the harnesses just dropped in place over them from the ceiling. The equipment was out the door and on the way to the fire in under 30 seconds. Now, in the picture, Haley, if you go back to the first photo of the firehouses, you're gonna see in the very center, the picture of that bell. That's the Memorial Fire Bell. And that position today is right in the front off Pearl Street in front of the Grand Rapids Public Museum. And that bell was cast in 1878. And it called the original city's volunteer firefighters for its first 10 years. It hung in a wooden tower at the southeast corner of Pearl and Ottawa, where the trust building is today. In 1888, it was moved to the clock tower of the old historic City Hall, where for 81 years, that bell you're looking at rang on the hour, at this point, helping Grand Rapidians keep track of time. It was struck by a hammer on the outside of the bell, which may be an explanation for the chipped area on its back. And you can see that when you stroll along that, uh, the backside of that bell today. So in 1969, when City Hall was demolished, the bell was saved. It spent about 17 years on Monroe Center. It stood for a while at the new City Hall, then moved here in 1995 after the construction of the new museum. Now mounted on this brick pedestal, there's a plaque beneath the bell. It reads, the memorial bell first told in 1878 as a call to action. The firefighters of Grand Rapids Locus 366 present this bell to the citizens of our community. Let it stand forever as a tribute to all firefighters who have served and to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. And that was um, dated in 1995. So at least 19 firefighters have died in the line of duty in the history of the Grand Rapids Fire Department. Now we're going on to a dip. Oh, by the way, can I point out just a little architectural feature? If we go back, Haley, to the uh, previous, see the fire truck coming out of the garage and it's really flat. It's really kind of a low flat machine. And you see kind of a raise, the, to the, the street level is a little raised going into the firehouse. Now, if we go forward, Haley, to the next slide, you see that that, 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 that slant, that slope was level. And that's because today's fire trucks are much taller and they have all this equipment on top and they couldn't get in the doors but they wanted to save the building as is, so they just went down instead of changing the top. Kind of a neat little story. Okay, now we're going on to the north, continuing north on LaGrave to Fulton. Recognize this corner. Today you would see One Trick Pony and the cottage bar, and you can see signage for the cottage bar in this photograph. Well, the cottage bar is proud to be the oldest continuously operating bar and restaurant downtown. You always have to hear the end of the sentence because Nick Finks will claim in Kent County. So this is the oldest continuously operating bar and restaurant downtown. It was opened as the Cottage Sandwich Shop by Earl and Marie Kuhn 
who lived upstairs on the second floor. Now, it was opened in 1927 during Prohibition. So it was opened as a sandwich shop. So they were awarded the very first liquor license in Grand Rapids post Prohibition. That was in 1933. And they renamed the restaurant the Old Cottage Bar and Grill. At that time, there were multiple small factories around the bar and that drove business. The factories would, they would order burgers at lunchtime by the hundreds. Known for their casual charm and down to earth atmosphere, they are famous for having great burgers and that accounts for about 60 to 70 percent of their sales. They have three different styles of award-winning chili. This is maybe the equivalent of Grand, you know, Cheers, the bar in Boston. This is Grand Rapids Cheers. The current owner, Dan, and uh, his wife, Lisa Verhill, he's the son, Dan is the son of the third owner of this property, John Verhill who purchased the cottage bar in 1967 from that second owner, Peter Verano. Dan took over in 1980. They also own the One Trick Pony. They have an unusual liquor license. I want you to look at this photograph and note this little patio between, this would be on the left-hand side of the screen, the little patio between the cottage bar and it would attach to the One Trick Pony. Well, this is the unusual liquor license. So there's just one license between the two properties. The liquor is delivered to the cottage bar and then they walk it over to the one trick pony. The alleyway physically between the two properties was converted into a patio and was, they like to claim, the very first outdoor dining, El Fresco in Grand Rapids and they did that in 1980. It was rumored that in the 1930s, mobster Al Capone frequented the restaurant and he sat in the back corner booth, but he always faced the door. President Ford was known to visit the cottage bar and Mike Wallace was said to have called in his reports to Wood Radio from the restaurant's payphone at the beginning of his career. Actor Michael Keaton is one of the famous faces to have stopped in during a visit to Grand Rapids it was announced for sale. The Verhills are selling Cottage Bar and One Trick Pony, and that was in early 2020. So I haven't heard any news on that of late. Now, I want you to note where it says timeless. That is an art prize afterglow. That is a piece of art prize and entry that was left here in Grand Rapids. Let me tell you a little bit about that. It was a artist by the name of Andy Rudloff. She's a Kentucky, Tennessee based artist. She created what she refers to as a community mural and that was in 2016. It's actually, if you look really carefully, it's comprised of the images and icons associated with Grand Rapids and the art prize competition. So she scaled this Grand Rapids design to fit the tiny building, and this is their storage shed, and it was provided by the Cottage Bar for this purpose. But what the artist did is she invited art prize supporters and sponsors to paint with her. So Andy drew an outline of the artwork and the volunteers filled in the color. But what's fun is in this process, she took a, a really neat time-lapsed video of the whole creation, and it was part of the actual exhibit. And you can still, if you search for timeless video on YouTube, you can still see it today. Um, and another fun piece of information about this is that the story during our prize was actually picked up as a feature article in the Chicago Tribune, much to the pleasant surprise of the owners of the Cottage Bar, of course. So now we are going to start walking south on Jefferson. And the first place we start is a fanatorium. And did you know a fanatorium is a bowling alley? 
Well, it is. And the original thanatorium that this gentleman I'm going to describe was established, it was established on Library Street in 1925, the original one, and then they built here. But the gentleman who built here was a, name, a gentleman by the name of William T. Morrissey Sr., okay? And he moved into the state of the art facility 14 years later. So it was in 1925 when he built his original thanatorium and then moved here to this building, opened in 14 years. Well, what's really cool about Mr. William T. Morrissey is that he noticed because he was uh, involved in girls softball somehow in Grand Rapids and he noticed um, a woman by the name of Marion Ladewig and her athletic race in a, a local softball tournament in 1937, Marion Ladewig. She was 22 at the time and he suggested maybe she come into the fanatorium and try bowling. She was 22 at the time. Well, you know what? Marion Ladewig became an eight-time U.S. Open champion. She emerged as the sport's first media star and helped elevate women's bowling to a more competitive level. She was a nine-time winner of the Bowling Writers Association Woman Bowler of the Year honor and the only woman ever to win city, state, and national titles in the same season. She was voted the greatest woman's bowler of all time in 1973. She also worked for years for Brunswick Bowling out of Muskegon. So if not for that William Morrissey who built this fanatorium, we may not have heard about Marion Ledewick. In 2001, this actual building was purchased by, called at the time Catholic Social Services, now referred to as Catholic Charities West Michigan. They completely remodeled the building, no more bowling, and it is now the agency's, it is their administrative offices. So when you go by that building, now you know it's got a much deeper history. So we continue our walk. We're going down south on Jefferson, and we arrive to the corner. And we're at the corner of Jefferson and State Street, and at one point in time, there was a three-story red brick mansion built in 1854 that stood here of Jefferson. And it's actually Washington. They all kind of, it's a confluence of the three streets. In 1903, that stately mansion housed our earliest public museum. And I, I love the writing on the photograph there. It was called the Grand Rapids Lyceum of Natural History at one point. That mansion museum building was eventually deeded to the city in 1937 on one condition, that it could only be used for museum purposes and that it revert back to the school district if it ever stopped being used for that purpose. Hmm, this all sounds pretty amazing. Soon, a bigger and better structure was needed for the museum. So when Grand Rapids architect was hired, Roger Allen is his name, to do this building, to design this building, he designed this in the late 1930s. He saw things differently, much differently. It opened to the public in 1940 as one of the last projects funded by the works Projects Works Progress Administration. The Grand Rapids Public Museum building stands today as a testament to progressive and innovative museum design. You see, this is what Roger Allen had in mind. Up until the completion of this structure you're looking at, most museums were very classically styled and heavily ornamented with monumental stairs leading up to their front doors, right? Museums upstairs up there you're looking up at them often these buildings were set back from the sidewalk to accentuate their importance 
Well, Roger Allen, he decided to reject that nostalgic form and instead introduce a simple structure with a street level entry. He wanted it to come hither, come into this museum. Don't be intimidated by the building. The, ba the basic building clad in smooth limestone above a base of polished black granite also incorporates sort of a storefront window so that it could, as former museum director Frank Dumond expressed in 1935, capture the attention of passers-by. You could change displays. This clearly egalitarian access was revolutionary at the time and was literally conveyed that the public building was expressly for public use. It was simply more welcoming than museums of the past. When the current Grand Rapids Public Museum opened in 1994 on Pearl Street, this vacated building became an opportunity. Now, there was a period of time when it was empty, but in 2015, the city sold the building back to the school district per that original agreement for $1. From 1994 until September 2018, as I mentioned, the building was quiet, but 54 Jefferson reopened as a public building again. The new Public Museum High School was made possible by a grant. The project was funded as one of the 10 super schools that were awarded a $10 million grant from XQ, the super school project, which is funded by Lorraine Jobs, businesswoman, advocate for education and widow heir to Steve, to Steve Jobs. The project was chosen from nearly 700 applicants from across the country. The project had numerous partners, including collaboration between the Grand Rapids Public Museum, of course, the Grand Rapids Public Schools, Kendall College of Art Design at FSU, GVSU, and the City of Grand Rapids. And that's how we get things done in Grand Rapids. We collaborate. The Public Museum High School will eventually house grades 9 through 12 as they add a year each year. That first class to enter in the fall of 2018 came over from the museum school at the Grand Rapids Public Museum on Pearl Street, which houses grades six to eight, or 180 students. And that launched in 2015. So the incoming class of 90 freshmen that came into this building also was the first class to attend that newly created museum school in 2015 as sixth graders. How cool is that? To attend the school, it is not a test-in program. It's rather a lottery system within the Grand Rapids Public School is one of their theme schools. In an article in Grand Rapids Magazine, the architect Mark Miller wrote, this is not a museum that was turned into a school. Rather, it is a museum where kids go to school. After all, 70% of the museum's archives, 250,000 artifacts strong, will be accessible to the students during their school day. The relationship between school and museum has officially come full circle. Very cool. Now we're gonna turn left on the corner on State Street and we are going to see a contrasting very, very, very old building. But first we're gonna talk about the bust you see of Lincoln. Now only a handful of public sculptures existed in Grand Rapids prior to World War I. And this is one of them. This is a 50 inch tall bust of Lincoln in what we now call Lincoln Place Park. In the history of American art, there are more images representing our presidents than any other subject. And of all the American presidents, the likeness of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln are most commonly encountered. Prior to the arrival of several portrait likenesses of Gerald Ford beginning in the late 20th century, 
the sculptor, the famous sculptor, I might add, world-renowned Adolf Weinmans, Abraham Lincoln Bust, was the most celebrated likeness in Grand Rapids. The park was deeded in 1849, this little triangular piece of property, by Canton Smith, an early settler in 1837 to Grand Rapids, who gave the land to the city in 1849 as a green space, and they called it State Street Park. In 1913, the sculpture of Lincoln was erected and the property was renamed Lincoln Park. The bust is a gift from Lorraine Pratt Immen, who also donated the Longfellow sculpture in Veterans Memorial Park across from the library. She also donated the stained glass windows in her church at Park Congregational. Now on the same day in 1849, Smith gave the city another triangular park at Cherry and State, and that's called Foster Park. But let's talk a moment about the building the Charles P. Calkins building. It was built in 1837. Now this is the longest standing building in Grand Rapids history. We refer to St. Mark's Episcopal Church, the oldest building in Grand Rapids still in use, and that was built in 1848. This was built in 1837, so it's the longest structure, not in use, but it's still standing. It is a symbol of the city's beginnings, the Charles Calkins Law Office. It is classic Greek style architecture, popular in that time of early America, when the days of Greece may be revived in the woods of America. The foundation of this building is Grand River Limestone, and inside are just two rooms, such as a law office would need, an entry room and then the rear private office. When young Calkins built his law office, it was not originally located here, but it was near today's Monroe Center. He occupied the office from 1837 to 1849. Calkins and his wife, Mary Ann, died of old age and are buried in the Fulton Street Cemetery. Clara Calkins, the daughter of Charles and Mary Ann, she married a Civil War hero Joseph Herkner. Joseph opened Herkner Jeweler Jewelry in 1867, one of the oldest businesses in Grand Rapids history. It was downtown for 141 years before moving to the East Beltline location in 2008. Now, the building, the Grand Rapids Public Museum restored this building and they moved it to this location with a dedication ceremony in 1976. But more recently, the bust and the Calkins Law Office, they were restored again by the leadership of two Eagle Scouts in the year 2010, Corey Alberta and Travis Lapsch. They had a project and they, in their senior year of high school, and they helped raise $37,000. That was including a $25,000 grant from our own DDA, Downtown Development Authority. They oversaw this whole project. They um, uh, replaced the building's roof and deck. They repainted. They uh, arranged for professional restoration of the bus, and they added fresh landscaping all because of two Eagle Scouts' vision to keep the history alive. So now, further south, at our southwest boundary of the Heartside neighborhood, is a medical campus consisting of Mercy Health St. Mary's and Mary Freebed Hospital. And the Marys in the titles are not related two different stories. So let's talk about St. Mary's Hospital first. At the turn of the century, a two-story frame house located at 145 Lafayette Southeast belonged at one time to Mrs. Mary McNamara. Well, she deeded that property to Catholic Bishop Richter, 
for the purpose of building a 15 patient bed hospital to be named in Mary's honor. So her property looked straight at St. Andrew's Cathedral where the bishop presided. Now the Sisters of Mercy of Big Rapids were helping them establish this hospital. So they sent three nurses, nursing sisters from a hospital in Big Rapids that had been built in Big Rapids at that time to serve Northern Michigan lumbermen. Well, they came to Grand Rapids and in 1901, St. Mary's Hospital was officially opened. In the early days, these sisters, Sister Mary Ignatius McCord, Sister Mary Anthony McMullen, and Sister Mary Baptist Feldner, there's a lot of Marys, not only provided the nursing care, they also did the duties of housekeeper and janitor. At the end of the first year, the three sisters cared for 69 patients and they showed a profit of 65 cents. Before long, the three sisters had converted the home into two first floor wards with additional rooms on the second floor and even in the attic. By the end of its first decade, the hospital had added a three-story wing and acquired a nurse's dormitory and a maternity department. As Grand Rapids continued to grow, it was clear that a new larger St. Mary's Hospital was needed. And the 1911 dedication of a five-story fireproof stone building featuring 42 private rooms, two large wards, operating rooms, and an emergency room broke brought to a close the first rapid, the first phase of rapid development set in motion when the sisters arrived in Grand Rapids less than 20 years at that time earlier. Now, if we flash forward, it was in August of 2011 that St. Mary's Healthcare became part of the new Mercy Health System. Interesting beginning. Now we go next door, directly south is the Mary Freebed Hospital. There's the name again. What's the story? Well, first of all, as you know, Mary Freebed, and we're proud, proud Grand Rapidians, proud Heartside neighborhood supporters, because this is a not-for-profit, not-for-profit, nationally accredited acute care rehab hospital that serves children and adults as the fifth largest rehab hospital in the US. For more than 120 years, Mary Freebed has been restoring hope and freedom through rehab. The scope of services offered on the Mary Freebed campus is not found anywhere else in Michigan. The recently enlarged and updated facility now boasts 167 inpatient beds for patients with rehab needs due to spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, multiple fractures, amputations, stroke, and other medical conditions. Now, Mary Freebed Rehab Hospital, though, this is the part of the story I love. It actually originated in 1891, when a small group of Grand Rapids women recognized the, the need for medical care for patients of limited financial means in our community. This was before the times the time of uh, uh, insurance and um, uh, Medicaid, Medicare. This was when people paid out of their pocket to go to the hospital. And there were people who had limited financial means. So what they did, rather than focus on building a structure at that time, they embarked on a fundraising campaign to secure the use of a free bed in an existing hospital. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It's sort of like endowing a musician in the orchestra. Um, it, it, it was funds to pay a hospital to provide a free bed for those who needed care of limited um, means. So the group solicited financial support from the Grand Rapids community. They were asking for 10 cent contributions. And here is their clever, clever marketing campaign. They knew that everybody knew a Mary back at that time. So they said, 
we want you to give 10 cents for, um, to our cause from everyone named Mary, as well as those having friends or relatives with the name Mary. They soon raised enough money to endow this free bed, which subsequently became known as the Mary free bed. And then the rest is history. They continued to grow until they needed their own facility. They were located in other locations in town until they built here. Now, in summary, we've moved eastward in five presentations, eastward in geography and forward in time over the last five presentations. But our last virtual walking tour is going to be in two weeks. I'll be so sad. It takes us to the most eastern boundary of the Heartside neighborhood as we focus on the historically significant religious buildings. We'll see how these same buildings will now take us into the future. They will probably, these historically significant buildings will stand probably long after we're all gone. So let's celebrate them in two weeks together. So thank you everyone. Great, thank you everybody for coming today. We just wanted to point out a um, round of applause for Caroline. Uh, she always does a fantastic job. Uh, you can go ahead and put your thoughts about today's presentation into the survey. Um, the survey link has been posted in the chat. Uh, for those of you, Mary, we will make sure uh, that we send it to you directly if you're unable to get it out of the, the chat link, but we encourage you to, to do that as soon as possible. Just wanted to also thank our community partners, Downtown Grand Rapids Incorporated has funded not only the tour series, but uh, maintaining the tour um, online and into the future. And so we're excited about uh, being able to offer these tours uh, digitally in the future so you can listen to them look at the map and go out and take the walk and we also want to just take a second to recognize the grand rapids public museum archive the grand rapids public library the city of grand rapids archives and records and the grand rapids historical commission for loaning us the use of some of the images that you've seen in today's presentation thank you for all of those community partners for helping out in creating this and to caroline for doing such an amazing job researching and presenting the information. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording and open us up for a conversation if anyone would like to just uh, speak out and ask any questions. <laughs>